Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Slip, Trip, and Fall Investigations. During this program, the presenter will cover some of the most common types of flooring and their characteristics, review common maintenance techniques and potential problems associated with them, identify methods of testing a floor and the equipment used, provide definitions of static and dynamic coefficients of friction, the standard of measure used to determine the slip resistance of a floor surface, review the ANSI NFSI standards related to floor safety, and finally review some of the other issues related to floor safety, such as formats, single steps, short stairways, and ramps. The presenter for today's program is David Dodgers. David is a certified walkway auditor safety specialist. He has more than 50,000 hours of hands-on construction, building inspection, and consultation experience. As an expert, David provides attorneys with expert consultation services in the following areas, personal injury, construction accidents, OSHA, construction defects and damages, building code, and building inspections. He performs site inspections, writes expert reports, and presents expert testimony. We'll take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your question to the presenter. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout today's presentation. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out an email with a link to the archive recording of this program. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's webinar is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn our presentation over to our distinguished guest, Mr. David Doddridge. David, the program is now all yours. Well, thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, uh, we have about 67 or 68 slides, so we have a lot of uh, material to cover. Um, so let's get started. Slip, trip, and fall investigations. Um, I am a uh, certified walkway auditor safety specialist under the uh, National Floor Safety Institute. Um, and according to them, uh, a qualified auditor is um, an individual who has completed a re nationally recognized training program that offers knowledge, skills, understanding through successful examination, testing, and demonstration in the methods, measurement, analysis, and recording of walkway slip resistance data. Uh, so I have successfully completed their course, and uh, I've performed many floor audits. Goals and objectives of this course um, since this course is geared to attorneys, I thought it was important to, and I'm not an attorney, but to get advice from uh, experienced personal injury attorneys. So I consulted with them. So we're going to we're going to um, run through some of the things that that they have uh, suggested that that, that uh, an attorney may do when they first get a slip and fall case. Uh, and we'll go into these other things listed here. I'm not going to read each slide to you guys. Uh, you'll be getting a copy of this um, course tomorrow for further review. Uh, so what should an attorney do when you first get a slip and fall case? Uh, and this would, this would help uh, your expert, of course, as well. Go to the scene, take pictures from all angles. Uh, you never know. Uh, try to preserve the scene as best you can via uh, photographs, observation, take notes, sit, watch, um, uh, watch the pedestrians. Uh, you can typically find liability just by just by watching. Uh, make note of the weather conditions. Of course, um, the addition of water to a walkway surface can make it. Uh, much slipper, much more slippery. Uh, uh, of course, ask the client if there are any witnesses. Uh, give a statement. Uh, interview employees. If it's in a, say, a grocery store, 
a market or, or a, a retail establishment, whatever it may be, um, they know the building better than anybody. So the data that you can gather could, could prove to be very, very beneficial uh, throughout the life of the case. Um, now some of these, again, this, these, uh, these recommendations come from uh, attorney clients of mine, so I'm not going to get too far into things, but uh, check the status of the owner, find out who the owner or lessee is. Uh, go to the city hall, find out if the business is registered and and to whom. Uh, and this next point is is interesting. Um, obtain emergency room records and read them before hiring an expert. And this came from a a, a very highly experienced personal injury client of mine. Uh, doctors use templates uh, in the emergency room. Um, those templates could stay. That they that they uh, that the plaintiff reported that they fell at home when in fact uh, they fell at a supermarket. Uh, if that's the case, then you'd have to get a, a note from the doctor stating where the plaintiff actually reported that, that they fell. So that can be uh, obviously time consuming. Uh, uh, become your own expert. You have to know whether you have a case or not before you hire an expert. Experts are are expensive. Um, uh, do some research on your own, observing the scene, uh, interviewing uh, witnesses, going to City Hall, finding out what codes um, apply to this particular building. Uh, building codes are grandfathered in. Um, uh, some building codes use, uh, well, we'll get into building codes a little later on, so I'll explain that in, in more detail. So let's Move on here. Um, OSHA regulations, um, of course, could could apply uh, with regards to uh, the slip resistance of a floor. If in fact it was in uh, a business uh, at at, uh, at a place of work, uh, finding out which local and state codes apply to the subject building is also important. Um, uh, local and state codes can vary. Um, uh, cities, most urban areas, such as New York, uh, Boston, have their own uh, codes. So you have to you have to look into which codes apply, okay. uh, which with regards to building codes depends on when the building was first built. Uh, there are, of course, uh, building maintenance codes. Uh, for example, uh, again in New York, the the uh, building owner or and or lessee of the um, of the building is responsible for maintaining the sidewalk, even though they don't own it, uh, up to the curb. That includes snow removal. That includes um, the condition of the uh, of the walking surface. If you walk down um, a sidewalk in New York, for example, you'll see that the concrete is broken up into squares and rectangles. These are known as sidewalk flags because they're sort of shaped like a flag. And they will heave, um, uh, frost heaves, uh, uh, differentiation and settlement underneath uh, various ones. So, so you'll see that they grind down the edge so that they sort of taper the edge so that it's not an abrupt, you know, one and a half inch high uh, trip step. But so, so they'll grind the edge of the sidewalk flags down in order to make it a safer walking service. And, and that is the responsibility of uh, the business. Uh, its state industrial codes um, can vary slightly. In Massachusetts, for example, there's the, uh, the CMRs which is the Code of Massachusetts Regulation, and um, uh, they oftentimes will mirror OSHA regulations, but they should still be checked. So there are local codes, state codes, and um, uh, federal OSHA 
regulations that could apply. Uh, part of the discovery process should also include um, requests for maintenance records, uh, floor cleaning schedules, the methods and techniques and floor products that are used. Uh, if the floor was installed recently, then um, uh, what type of floor is it? You can't always tell by looking at it. Uh, and therefore, if there are any, any quote, attic pieces of flooring, in other words, uh, extra pieces, and there always are, that are left over that they, that they keep in the attic or they keep in the storage room or whatever it may be, uh, just in case they need to replace a piece later on. And you'd be surprised at how, how um, just the wear and tear of the use of a floor can um, become more slippery than the original piece before it's installed. Uh, okay, key market segments that are most affected by slips and falls, as listed here. Again, I'm not going to read each one of these to you. You get a copy of this presentation tomorrow. Causes and contributing factors. 50% uh, of slips and falls are caused by walkways, uh, aka floor surface. 24% uh, are caused by footwear. Uh, other factors, of course, physiological factors, volunteering, vision, social factors, age, health, preoccupation, and somebody walking along while they're texting, um, and of course, environmental issues. Lighting is a, is a, a big one. The introduction of, of, uh, of contaminants to a floor surface, contaminant meaning spilled coffee, it could be um, water, it could be motor oil, it could be any number of, of different things. So, uh, um, all right, common types of flooring. Floor surfaces change over time, particularly with the introduction of contaminants, uh, which is dirt. Of course, uh, improper maintenance, uh, not using the floor care products the way that they are intended. We'll get into that a little bit later. But these are the most common types of flooring that you'll see. Natural stone like uh, granite, uh, of course, ceramic tile, wood. You have to be careful. If you're looking at a floor that looks like wood, it could very easily be what's known as a laminate floor. Um, generic name is uh, is pergo, and it's easy for me to tell whether it's a real wood floor or not. We'll get into that a little bit later too. And there there would be a difference. Of course, wood is is much more porous than a laminate floor is going to be. A laminate floor is like formica. But it, it's the same, basically the same concept, like a formica countertop. Um, synthetic materials, DCT uh, that you see oftentimes in Walmart. Uh, for example, uh, concrete floors are becoming very, very, very popular these days. Uh, concrete floors are typically uh, one big mass of concrete. They'll, they'll cut in um, control joints and expansion joints, but they'll be separated into much bigger squares or patterns that, that, that allow you to tell whether it's... Uh, you know, individual tiles or not. Individual tiles uh, are usually maximum maybe 18 to 28 to, to 20 inches uh, square. Usually like 12 inches square or maybe a little bit less. And of course, coated floors such as epoxy coating used perhaps in a uh, industrial setting. That is a natural stone floor. That's a granite. Um, ceramic tile, which of course you've all seen, a glazed a glaze coating over it. Natural wood floors. Now this it's hard to tell, but there's a seam right there. Uh, get my pointer, sorry. Hang on a second. There's a seam 
of one course right there. Could be another seam right there. Another seam right there. So this would tell me that this is an actual wood floor. If this were a pergo floor or laminated floor, you'll see two courses with one seam going straight across both, both, and then another, and then another seam going straight across both. And that does not happen with a wood floor. Each plank, each plank is is laid individually, whereas with a laminated floor, um, they come in 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 groups of two planks. So you'll see a seam across two and then a seam across two. That's one way you can tell whether it's a natural floor or not. Uh, this is a VCT floor. You'll see it again in Walmart, uh, large department stores, um, concrete, which of course is, is porous. Uh, there are coatings and sealing, sealers, of course, that uh, go on the concrete during the finishing process. Um, and this is an epoxy coated floor that you might see in uh, like a factory setting or something like that. Okay, floor maintenance. The introduction of contaminants can cause the floor surface to, to become polymerized. Polymerized films are slippery. By polymerization, and what, what I'm talking about there is, is um, you know, if you look at a, at a, say, a granite floor under a microscope, for example, you'll see it's got holes. So it's got uh, divots. It's, it's not. It's not. Uh, it may feel perfectly smooth, but it isn't. So those, those um, holes and and uh, depressions and divots uh, over time get filled in with very fine particles of dirt, uh, soap residue, that kind of thing. And as that happens, it becomes more slippery. Um, so therefore, the removal of those contaminants uh, using proper floor clean techniques is, uh, is as important in preventing slips and falls as is the floor itself. Um, typically, Uh, floor cleaning te techniques, high-speed burnishing machines. I'll, I have a picture of one, which I'll get to in a second, um, which uses a synthetic synthetic pad to remove scuff marks and increase the gloss of the floor. But that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's less slippery. Um, auto scrubbing machines uh, is a machine that applies the, the agent, scrubs the floor with brushes, and then extracts the dirty solution. Um, it mechanically removes the contaminants from the floor surface, i.e., uh, with the brushes. Um, so that will that, that's that's the best way to, to clean the floor. Those those machines are very expensive. Of course, the mop and bucket is still the most common cleaning method for a floor. Um, When you clean a floor with a mop and bucket, basically what you're doing is you're taking water mixed with cleaning products and, and smearing it all over the floor. You might be getting some of the dirt up, but really what you're doing is just sort of spreading it around and letting it air dry. Um, once it's dry and then you reintroduce um, liquid, on it, then it can very easily become slippery again, as opposed to if the um, floor surface was cleaned using a mechanical method, mechanical meaning a, a brush, to, to actually loosen the, the um, particles and, and remove the uh, That's an auto scrubber. Uh, it scrubbed the floor with a brush, thus loosening the um, contaminants, and then it dries it um, at the ends. So it, it's it's wet up here, but but back here, as you move it across the floor, it is uh, it is dry. Some of these you'll see a, a ride on, kind of like a, a ride on lawnmower, like at a hospital. You'll see um, a maintenance guy 
riding on top of one of these. That's very similar to, to this. That's a floor burnisher. Um, and that really shines up the floor. Um, makes it look nice, but not necessarily um, less slippery. And of course, we have the good old fashioned mop and bucket here as well. Now, this is important. The, the amount of cleaning solution that's added to the water can affect the slip resistance of the floor. Um, the cleaning solution used will have a, um, a ratio listed on it. Uh, so many ounces of uh, of solution to so many gallons of water, for example, um, and those are not those, those instructions are not always followed. Of course, uh, the maintenance personnel will simply uh, eyeball it. They'll they'll dump some in and they'll fill the bucket up, and and then once they get into that routine, then they'll do it the same way every single time, and they could very easily be doing it incorrectly. So it, it's not often. And that uh, that they'll actually measure uh, how much solution per gallon that they actually use. Um, certifications on the cleaning products is also important, such as those issued by the National Floor Safety Institute. Um, the gentleman who, who is the um, president of that organization actually created a a, a non Slope, not non-slope uh, floor care system some years ago, and it, it's a, it was a system that um, that did not use soap to clean the floor because slope, the soap when mixed with water then uh, is allowed to air dry, and you again you reintroduce liquid to it, and it becomes slippery all over again. So what they do is they actually certify products. Uh, um, uh, floor cleaning products, amongst others, um, that they test in their laboratory and uh, and certify them. Uh, floor mats. A lot of people don't realize the importance of floor mats, what we call walk-off mats. When you walk in the front door of a commercial building, um, and those mats are either rented uh, or owned by the building owner. And what they do is they stop soil and water at the door. You come in off the street or off the sidewalk, you walk in, and the purpose of those mats is to uh, essentially clean your shoes as, as you walk over them and store that, that soil and water uh, for later re removal. Um, uh, they should be in good shape. They should have no ripples or curls. Um, obviously, be slip resistant. Um, and they should stay in place. Here's a good example of, of a floor mat. Um, somebody walked across it, and as they walk across it, it, it basically is designed so that it removes the contaminants from their, the soles of their shoes. Uh, this is a floor mat that I, um, on a case that I, I was involved with, it's not in uh, the correct location, and come to find out, it was used, being used to cover considerable defect in the uh, concrete curb below it. That is obviously not, not the proper use of of a mat. And somebody actually was walking with one of these carts here, and and uh, and fell as a result. What floor mats should not do, of course, is buckle. That causes a tripping hazard. Crack, flip over, migrate, meaning move, uh, or fail to contain water. If they're not properly maintained, they could contain too much water. Uh, on, a, on a rainy day or a snowy day with lots of people coming in and out of the building, uh, those mats can fill up, and then they fail to, to really do what they're designed to do. Um, 
I just saw, I'm sorry, I just saw a, uh, a question here. I, I'm hoping that my audio is, is good. Somebody's asking if there's an echo in the audio presentation. Um, there is, I can't do anything about it on my end. All right, now here we go. Here we get into the, the sort of the meat and potatoes of this. Is um, uh, methods of testing a floor. To determine the slip resistance of a floor, certain standards such as those written by ANSI and FSI must be adhered to. Now, ANSI is the uh, American National Standards Institute, and FSI is the National Floor Safety Institute. ANSI and NFSI have, have uh, collaborated and written standards, industry standards, um, uh, to test and audit a floor. Uh, one of the, the ways to, to measure the slip resistance of a floor is by the use of a tribometer, um, and that is, is a device that is used to measure the coefficient of friction on a floor surface, which is the unit of measure. Testing is done wet or dry. Uh, wet testing is performed with distilled water as per the standard. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, we're going to be doing a Q&A in about six minutes here. Um, there are a variety of different types of tribometers. I've got some photos. Uh, the James machine is, is older, um, an older machine. It's not portable. A drag sled, which is uh, something that you uh, pull and it slides along the surface of the floor. That's uh, what I have, uh, that is a portable device. A pendulum, uh, a robotic device such as the BOT 3000, which is um, uh, to measure the coefficient of friction, wet or dry, static or dynamic, and we'll get into that, those definitions in a minute. Um, uh, the testing equipment must meet the requirements of the standard being used. Uh, um, the standard being uh, such as the one that is uh, has been written by ANSI and NFSI. Okay, there's a James machine. David, do you want to? I think we're supposed to take a Q and A break right now. Do you want to take that? I didn't insert okay. it in in the slides, but um, yeah, so I, was, we... I was going to take it at. Uh, yeah, we can take it now. Since we're at slide 33, we've got about 66 slides, so we're about halfway through. Some of the other slides are going to take a little bit more time, but yeah, that's fine. Sure. Okay, great. So uh, we'll open it up to Q&A, uh, a short Q&A break now. If you have a question, uh, please submit it using either the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the, uh, the screen. David, um, just to start off the question and answer break, you have gone over a couple of the the cases that you've worked on, uh, especially when you talked about uh, a floor mat, um, what are the most common causes of slip, trips, and falls in your experience, and how can those be mitigated? Um, well, the, most common types of slips is usually from um, introduction of, of liquid. Um, uh, improperly maintained floor mat that is full of water. Um, uh, a woman walked across one, and then, and then, as she walked off the mat onto the floor, the floor was wet. Uh, the floor mat wasn't doing its job, and she slipped and fell, and uh, um, I believe fractured her ankle. Um, trip. A lot of the trips that I see are the result of a single step, and I've got photos um, later on in the presentation. Uh, single steps that are not easily visible, uh, and there's reasons for that, which which I'll cover. Um, um, and improper lighting, uh, usually on a stairway. Uh, lighting is huge. So those are those are some of the more common things that I see. Excellent. Uh, we have a, a, a question here from Paul who asks, 
Are you required to remove a piece of the flooring where the accident occurred and bring it to the James machine for testing? No, the James machine is is, is rather antiquated. The, uh, um, so no, no, we test it in place using a portable tribometer, um, which is as per the standard. You have to test to the standard. Um, and by and, and I, I believe I have a slide that addresses that. By testing to the standard, that means that you have to follow the procedures in the standard. So if somebody slipped on coffee, you don't test it with coffee because there is no standard written uh, to test the floor with coffee. And that's why we use uh, strictly distilled water only because that's what the standard uses. Okay, but but to answer your question, no, we bring the tribometer uh, to the scene and we test the floor right, right there. How uh, a follow up to that question from uh, from Paul is how do you ensure that the uh, the floor is in the condition that it was in when the accident happened? Uh, well. That's a good question. Um, you really can't, and that's probably why uh, some of the personal injury attorneys that I've consulted with regards to putting this presentation together are saying that as soon as you get a slip and fall case, as the attorney goes go go to the scene, bring the plaintiff with you. They can show you where they slip. Um, but you know, you really can't ensure that it's in the exact same condition as as it was at the moment of that uh, slip and fall, perhaps um, uh, a floor cleaning schedule. If it's a commercial building, a large commercial building, we usually um, keep records of that kind of thing on hand. Um, you know, if it's a fairly short period of time between the accident and when the floor is actually tested, then the chances are pretty high that it's in the that it's in the same condition. Um, that's about okay, the best way to answer that question. Questions. Continue on with the con the presentation of content uh, from Gary, who asks: Does the temperature of the floor, such as in a food storage room, affect the coefficient of friction of the floor? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I've never asked that question before. Um, I can't imagine that it would. However, I would also think that the manufacturer of the floor surface um, would specify whether their floor is appropriate for use in, like, say, a walk-in cooler or whatever it may be. Um, I would also imagine that that um, that uh, uh, like a walk-in cooler would be more subjected to uh, to moisture from perhaps condensation, from the door being open and shut. Um, whether the temperature itself affects the, the the coefficient of friction or not, I, I really don't know. I can I can find out from some colleagues. I've got a pad and a piece of paper here. Um, so I'm, I'm taking some notes, and I will be happy to follow up with that. Okay, and then finally, for this Q&A break, uh, a question from Scott who asks, how long should it take to perform a coefficient of friction test on a floor using both wet and dry methods? Uh, it doesn't take long. Um, I did one last week. Uh, was at a subway station in Boston on a stair tread, actually, and um, you tested in in uh, you, you do with the, the drag sled, which, which is the, the device that is pulled along the floor. Uh, I usually test it three times in each direction. So, so 
and, the, and each direction will be left to right, right to left, front to back, back to front, so four different directions. Uh, and then you uh, wet down with distilled water and you do the same thing. Probably 15 minutes, maybe something like that. And it's, okay. it's, it's, it's certainly a, a method that attracts attention. If you're going to try to do it without anybody noticing, then that's usually not, not going to be the case. <laughs> okay, great. I don't see any other questions uh, in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of, co of content? Okay. So that's a James machine. Um, that is a an English XL, an interesting machine. Uh, there's a CO2 cartridge that, that gets attached uh, right down in here, and that powers the, this piston that goes up and down. Um, uh, there is a, a, a standard for using this machine. The, the pressure, the gauge is over here. The pressure has to be in a certain range, meaning the pressure of the CO2 cartridge that, that goes right here. And then what you do is, is um, pull this. Uh, trigger and and the piston goes down, and the surface right down here comes in contact with the floor. And if it does not jump forward in this direction, then you move this handle back, and you you repeat again and again and again until until this pad or sensor comes in contact with the floor and actually flies. And the coefficient of friction reading is whatever this little needle is pointing to based upon the angle of this handle. So that's that's an interesting machine. Um, uh, this is a BOT 3000. It's robotic. Um, it's computerized. Uh, it's an expensive device. Uh, and it will measure uh, the coefficient of friction both wet and dry static or dynamic. Um, we'll get into the definitions of those in a second. Um, these are very expensive, I believe. They retail for between six and $7,000. Um, this is a drag sled. This is, this is one that I use. It's a pretty expensive piece of equipment as well. And what you, there are three sensors that are, are screwed to the bottom of this. Um, and what you do is you attach a um, a line that comes with it. Uh, uh, looks like a thick sort of fishing line uh, with a, a ring that you fit your finger into, and you and you rest your hand on the floor, and you use one finger to gently but steadily pull. And once it moves. Uh, then it automatically records the coefficient of friction right here. This can be used for a wet test or a dry test. Um, it's very portable and uh, it's, of course, recognized reliable method of, of testing a floor. Coefficient of friction, what is it? Um, maybe I should have had this slide earlier in the presentation. In, in engineering terms, it's, of course, defined as the force required to move two sliding surfaces over each other divided by, by the force holding them together. And I'll put that in layman's terms in a minute. Uh, static coefficient of friction refers to objects that are stationary and um, or, or static. The, so something standing on the floor. The dynamic coefficient of friction refers to objects that are actually sliding upon the floor. Um, not all tribometers are designed to measure both. Put in more simple terms, for the purpose of this presentation, a coefficient is a number or a, a constant or a multiplier. So therefore, if an object weighs 100 pounds and the static coefficient of friction criteria is 0.5, and you take 100 multiplied by 0.5, and therefore it would take 50 pounds of lateral force or sideways force placed against the object to cause it to break free of its static uh, friction and slide 
along the surface that it is sitting upon. So that's that's the simple definition. Um, some building codes uh, and ADA codes recommend the coefficient of friction that is 0.5 or greater. Uh, those are not always enforced, however. Uh, of course, the lower the number, the more slippery the surface is. Okay, so now we get into some, some codes and standards. This is important. Uh, various local, state, and federal governments require slash recommend that walking and working surfaces meet certain criteria. Uh, the International Code Council, which is the, the big building code uh, agency, uh, they author building codes that are then adopted by uh, states and by municipalities uh, from coast to coast. So, so building codes are becoming very much uh, universalized. Um, I'm also certified in um, under the International Code Council in building codes. Um, Americans with Disabilities Act, of course, we all know what that is. Um, occupation. Oh, that's found a typo. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. Uh, again, has uh, uh, recommendations for working services. Um, National Fire Protection Association, American Society of Safety Engineers. Um, so we'll get into each one of those. International Code Council, used to be known as BOCA. Uh, they got together with a few other agencies um, and combined forces now known as the International Code Council and they author all sorts of quote model codes. Those codes are then adopted by uh, by governments for use as their own building codes. For example, in Massachusetts, uh, I believe currently it is the 2009 uh, IBC which stands for International Building Code, and the 2009 IRC, International Residential Code. And those codes could also be adopted by the state of Kentucky or any other state, so they are very much the same as a result from one state to the next. Um, uh, these codes often use what are called reference standards within the code. Um, such as those developed by ANSI, ASTM, ASSE, NFSI. And ba so basically, uh, uh, the standards that are written by those agencies are referenced and used as a reference in a building code. So a section of a building code might say that something is to meet the, the uh, criteria of of a certain standard that's written by uh, by ANSI uh, or any of any other uh, underwriters laboratory is, um, is is another one. So so you have to understand that that codes use these industry standards within uh, the code uh, itself. Oftentimes, uh, the ADA uh, recommends walking surfaces with within an accessible route. Uh, which is also a path of travel, say, from uh, the furthest point in the building to the exit door of 0 0.60 or greater. On ramps, they recommend 0 0.80. And that's, that's for people with disabilities. These are recommendations only. They're not mandatory. Um, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, static coefficient of friction of 0.5 five or greater. Um, again, it's not mandatory. It's a recommendation. Um, slips, trips, and falls represent the majority of all industrial accidents, and that's certainly something I can attest to. I do a lot of construction accidents. Um, um, and they also, under their housekeeping rules, require um, Work, work areas, walking and working surfaces to be kept um, clean, uh, free and, and clear. 
National Fire Protection Association, much like the ICC, the NFPA offers codes uh, related to fire protection um, that are adopted. Now, you might say, well, what does fire have to do with this? Well, if there's a fire uh, and people are trying to escape from a building or trying to leave the building, then there are certain, uh, there could be certain hazards that they encounter along the way. So therefore, a, a safe means of egress is, uh, is very important. The American Society of Safety Engineers have been around for a long, long time. They write all sorts of safety um, standards that are adopted and used as reference standards within uh, building codes. Um, ANSI NFSI, ANSI again, American National Standards Institute, NFSI, National Floor Safety Institute. Um, uh, B101, 2012, is the walkway surface auditing standard <coughs> for me, uh, to measure the procedure, used for the procedure to measure the, the slip resistance of a walkway surface. Um, it was originally developed by NFSI, and the scope is to provide the technical procedures for walkway auditing and measuring the coefficient of friction. Um, that's, this is what I have been certified by it. Um, the purpose is to provide specific methods and procedures uh, for performing a walkway audit. And, and a, an audit is different from an inspection. An inspection is usually visual. An audit means that you're actually taking measurements. Um, um, move on to the next one. I, we, I have a lot of photographs towards the end of this presentation, so I'm sort of saving the best for last. Um, again, it's important to note that that um, it is important to uh, perform uh, the audit uh, according to the guidelines stated in the standard, which again, distilled water, um, certain procedures for prepping the tribometer before you use it, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and again, uh, and I've been asked this before, if uh, the client slipped and fell on coffee, um, does that mean that you test using coffee? And the answer is no, because there is no standard written for testing a floor with coffee. So you, you test it as per the standards so that, um, uh, so, that it, so that your test results will hold up um, so that you can testify to the fact that you performed uh, your audit as per a nationally recognized written standard. Uh, of course, you can then also test it with coffee if your client wanted you to and collect that data at the same time. That would be up to the, up to the, uh, up to the client, but you always test to the standard. Um, and that standard is broken down into a variety of different risk classes, um, risk class A, um, which are normally free and dry contaminants, such as hallways, uh, auditoriums, offices, where spills typically don't occur. Um, the criteria there is, is 0 0.50 or greater. That's a number that we, that we sort of strive for. Uh, the coefficient of friction on, on wet ice, uh, for example, is um, point 0.1 something, or it, it's obviously much, much lower than 0.5. Uh, risk class B, uh, areas that are, are occasionally wet or contaminated, such as those surrounding a... Um, uh, um, exterior door, restroom, break room, um, vending machine area is uh, criteria in that area is uh, 0.60 or greater. And risk class C, uh, areas that are normally wet, uh, such as floors that are intended to be wet. 
uh, locker rooms, swimming pools, uh, areas where solvents are used. And the criteria there is uh, 0.6 or greater as well. The ASTM, American Society for Testing Materials, also has a standard uh, for um, safe walking surfaces. Uh, the standard was uh, developed by them, known as F1637. And the scope of the standard is to cover the design, construction guidelines, maintenance criteria for new and existing buildings, to provide a reasonably safe walking surface for pedestrians. Um, I refer to this standard on a pretty regular basis uh, because it covers a lot, um, not just a floor. Uh, it covers all these, these different things, your carpeting, changes in level, i.e. a single step from one level to the next, say six inches, seven inches. Mats and runners, lighting, headroom, for example, on a stairway, outside walkways, hardware, uh, stairs and single steps, all these different things are are uh, covered, um, albeit some of the some of the minimally uh, in this standard. Um, now we get into some stuff that's a little more interesting to look at. Um, these are some examples of some other hazards. These are actually. Um, for my own cases that I've done, this is my tribometer being used on a uh, dry, I also tested this wet, um, stair tread in a subway station. Um, 0.61 is what it came out to. Um, my client wanted me to, to test the stairs in this subway station and in another one. Uh, for comparison's sake, so that's that's what I was hired to do. Um, this is a ramp outside of a restaurant. It's hard to tell in this photograph. This ramp is very much in compliance. It's fine. This this ramp right here. Um, again, it's hard to tell from the picture, but this ramp right here is considerably steeper than this ramp right here, um, and does not meet code. Uh, particularly when ice and water were introduced to it. My client came out of the door, walked towards his car, and really fell, really hurt himself, and was lying there for, for quite some time before anybody noticed. Uh, so, so it's not, not always easy to tell. When I measure the angle of a ramp, I use a, um, a digital level um, that is calibrated on a regular basis, which is important because then it, it will uh, hold up when uh, when testifying. Um, uh, this is in New York. It's hard to tell from this photograph, uh, but this is about an inch and a half high ledge, little lip right here. Um, and that causes the trip step. You really just can't even tell that it's there. And that stream came along and, and tripped and fell. And I think fractured an elbow or something like that. Um, but there, and there is this criteria for uh, the minimum height of something like this. Um, particularly, I believe, an ADA requires this to be, um, I, I can't recall, no greater than a quarter of an inch, I believe. And if it is, it has to have an angle on it so that it's not a, a, a direct, like, 90-degree uh lip there um, and try to eat up some time here. This is an interesting one. Um, this is a short stairway. Uh, and if you notice, in the direction of ascent, it's, it's pretty easy to distinguish. There's a step here and there's a step here because of the way the light reflects off of it. And there's a step here at the doorway which is which is a big no no and that is not allowed under current building codes. But if you're coming and I didn't get a picture of this in this direction, but if you're coming in the direction of descent, uh 
this tile is the exact same as this tile as is this tile, and the grout lines even line up. You can see the, all these grout lines line up. So when you're coming in the direction of descent, this floor will blend in with this landing. You really can't even tell uh, that there's a step there. And, and of course, somebody fell. Um, this surface should be flush with this surface. Uh, modern building codes require that. So there's not an immediate step down at the door itself, at the threshold of the door. There's other criteria for landing uh, also. But if you notice, and this is something that I noticed right away, is that this door in its open position obstructs the handrail. So really this handrail doesn't even become useful until you get to, to right about here. Well, there's already a step right here. So it, it really renders this portion of the handrail pretty useless. Um, and when you're, if you're older, you have vision problems, maybe uh, glasses or, or, or um, I think I've even, even not noticed this step myself. And, and uh, you know, just blends right together. You can't even tell that it's there. This is quite obvious. Uh, this is a, a, everything is wrong with this stairway. Uh, this guy really got hurt. I was at night, there's improper lighting, there's no landing, it's way too steep. Um, uh, and these, this, this exact type of stair was used on this doorway and others down in this direction as well. Um, uh, the distance in rise is, is, I believe this was around 9 or 10 inches, which is uh, uh, commercial codes required to be 7. And this could have been constructed with a landing right here and the stairway coming off of that landing. Um, obviously, the building owner took the cheap way out and just had these, these thrown up. Um, this handrail gripping surface is, is much too wide. That's a 2 by 4, which is 3 and a half inches. Um, it's supposed to be 2 and a quarter max so that you can grip it with your hand. Uh, there's, there's everything wrong with this stairway. Um, this is a, uh, walkway leading to uh, an apartment building that houses mostly older people. Um, a woman came from the hospital with fresh knee surgery, like the day before, very, very recent, called ahead to see if she could get help coming into this doorway right here, where, again, the surface is not flush. Um, uh, her sister, somebody helped her uh, unsuccessfully. She tripped going into the door, this, this, this step right here, and her knee went back in the opposite direction, and as a result, they had to they had to amputate. So, you know, little things like this may not look like much, but they are. They're a big deal. Um, again, uh, a single step. Uh, it's made out of the same material as this surface here, and it, it, depending on light, uh, the way the light bounces off, off of it, oftentimes you really can't even see that the step is even there. Um, there are single steps and, and trip steps all over the place. All it would take is a visual cue, uh, a contrasting stripe right along the leading edge um, to warn people, and, and maybe a sign that, with an arrow pointing downward that says step, step up, or whatever. So the solutions to these problems are oftentimes very, very uh, inexpensive. Um, everything is wrong with this stairway as well. It, this is an industrial stairway. Um, it had structural deficiencies. It, on, on a commercial stairway, you should have a handrail on both sides, not just one. Um, uh, this, this stairway is... is uh, it uh, lacks um, dimensional uniformity, meaning from this step to this step to this step. Code calls for a maximum of three-eighths of an inch variation um, from one step to the next for human uh, factor purposes. As you're coming down step after step after step, if all of a sudden one of them is considerably different than the last, then you can lose your balance. And that's exactly what happened here. 
Um, this is a close-up view of a structural stringer here um, of the same stairway. Uh, the nail coming through this stair tread caused this to eventually split, and this stair tread was quite loose as a result. Um, same stairway, uh, where it was fastened at the top, um, obviously very inadequate. Uh, this is at the entrance of a restaurant. Again, the deck is not flush with the door. Um, they could have built a little uh, wooden platform right out here, elevated one step up, uh, flush with this door. But it came in, an uh, older person came in, tripped, fell into the restaurant. Um, this is a good example of a curb ramp. couple of slides to go here. here. Um, all this material is the same. So it's hard to distinguish if there was a, there's a, a change in elevation here. A woman came along and she fell and she slammed her head against one of these planters here. Um, this is a good example, of course, of how to provide a visual cue um, and let people know that there is a change in elevation. Uh, again, it doesn't. Sometimes all it takes is a little bit of paint. This is a brick walkway on Long Island, where uh, a disabled vet was using a cane, and um, the cane got caught in this depression here, um, causing him to fall, and, and he broke a hip. Uh, this is how I, this is what I use to determine what that, that distance from here to here was. This is a scribing tool um, that I used, and it did not meet ADA requirements. Um, and that is slide 67, and that's the last one. Perfect timing, Matt. Oh no, it's great. We already have uh, some questions, some final questions in the queue, so we'll spend the next four or five minutes uh, going over those questions. Um, Charlene asks, can you please define ordinary footwear? Oh, ordinary footwear. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm not a footwear expert. So, um, uh, no, actually, I can't define ordinary footwear. <laughs> I know a little bit about it, but um, there are there are footwear experts out there, uh, one of which I am not. So I, I know that, a... that I know that I test my tribometer. I the sensors on the bottom of the tribometer are made out of neolite. Okay, N E O L I T E, and I believe that that is um, a material that is used in shoemaking, but but that's not my area of expertise. Um, we have a question here from Gary who asks, can you comment upon which types of flooring materials tend to be more slippery when wet? For example, does a wet floor tend to be more slippery, I'm sorry, does a wet tile floor tend to be more slippery than a wet wood floor? Um, uh, concrete is a pretty good example. Concrete is, has a lot more pores on on its surface, so it, so it takes the water better than, say, a granite or a, a, a non-porous material like a ceramic tile that has a, a glazing over it. You've heard of the term glazed tile, uh, and the water will just sit there. Whereas with, with, with a concrete floor, even though it's polished, it feels very smooth, um, is porous. Uh, wood um, depends on the finish. Uh, how recently it was refinished uh, with the polyurethane, uh, particularly in a commercial location, it can wear out pretty quickly. So uh, the more worn out it is, the, the more porous it's going to be because the finish is not on there as well as it was when it was originally sanded and, and, and finished. So uh, wood is porous. 
Concretus porus, um, ceramic tile is not, uh, granite is not, not um, so yes, there is there is a variation in porosity from one floor to the next. Okay, we have a question here from Michael who asks, what might stand what standards um, are there for, for carpeted surfaces? That's an interesting question. Um and I don't believe that there are um Standards written for measuring the slip resistance of a carpet. However, uh, that's an issue that we addressed in the NFSI certification course that I took. Uh, office environment, copying machine, um, carpeting surrounding it. Uh, somebody slipped and fell, which is unusual for carpet. Uh, come to find out that the technician that maintained the machine used an excessive amount of lubricant in his maintenance duties, and um, some of that lubricant um, uh, migrated to the um, carpeted surface and became very slippery as a result. But um, uh, there is no standard written that I know of for measuring the slip resistance of a carpet. Okay, great. We have uh, two more questions, and then we'll wrap up the program. A question here from Denise who asks, I understand general liquids can be used with distilled water, but what about other substances, i.e. motor oil, unknown substances, or cooking oils? Uh, well, again, you know, what, if, if a client called and they said, hey, you know, I, uh, somebody slipped in a... a um, jiffy lube on some motor oil, then uh, if that floor were to be tested, you always test to the standard because that is uh, the recognized, reliable method and, and uh, you know, of, of testing a floor. Then you can also test with whatever substance it is that was on the floor when the, the plaintiff slipped so that you can gather that, that data. Um, and then that would be really up to the attorney to, to present uh, to the court and say, you know, this floor was uh, was tested as per uh, nationally recognized standards with the uh, methodology that's uh, uh, recognized and reliable, and this these are the results, and then it was also tested with this substance on it, and this is the result. Um, but again, you have to test to the standard, and the standard, there is no standard written for testing with other types of liquid like cooking oil or motor oil. The, the only standard that's written to perform a wet test is by using uh, distilled water. Okay, and our final question is from Kent who asks, if a store entryway floor mat becomes full of water on a rainy day, what is the store supposed to do about it to solve the problem? A second mat next to it or replace it frequently or what else? Uh, they could add mats adjacent to it. Uh, they could uh, replace it because they have spare mats. So they, they could uh, um, take away um, and then put a, a dry mat down in its place. Um, they could uh, vacuum the mat using a, a, a wet-dry shop vac and, and suck all that water out of it. Um, so you know, there's various methods that they can that they can use, they just have to be um, told that, you know, especially on, you know, the building management has to be um, aware of, of excessive moisture conditions outside and act accordingly. Okay, excellent. Thank you, David. Do you have uh, any concluding remarks before we wrap up the presentation? Uh, I don't. Uh, basically, I think we covered a lot. Um, I hope I didn't go too, too fast. Um, uh, but again, you're going to be sending this presentation out to everybody. So uh, if they have any questions, they can certainly call uh, call CASA, um, hire me through them, and uh, um, or, or ask, just simply ask questions. Matt, if you want to forward questions that uh, some
some of the attendees have, then I'm, I'm happy to follow up via the email. You can forward the answer back to them. I'd be happy to do that. If you do have any follow-up questions, uh, you feel free to email them to me, and I will get them uh, to David promptly. Uh, so we're going to wrap up this afternoon's program. If, as David said, if you'd like to speak to him about a specific matter that you're currently working on, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319. As I stated during the introduction, tomorrow morning I'll send out a link to the archived recording of this program, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. The archived recording of this program, as well as all of our previous programs, can be found on our website. If you visit TASANET.com and go to the bottom of the home page, you'll see a link to our webinar series, uh, which directs you to a link to the archived recordings. Our next webinar, which will be hosted by David, Stairway and Step Investigations, will take place uh, next Tuesday, April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You should have received an invitation from me this morning. If you did not, I will include the link to register for the program on the 16th in the email that I send out tomorrow morning. And finally, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, please feel free to email me at mhide at tassinet.com. We do take all of your comments under consideration, and they help us to produce better programs. I will uh, look forward to seeing you at future TASA events, and I'm now going to end today's program. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.